Thank you very much for your time and for your patience. And sorry for the technical problems before. And thank you for your time, for coming here. And I see some familiar faces and for some new faces. Nice meeting you. And I'm Nazla Mariza. I'm Humphrey Fellow, as Marta already introduced me. And today I will talk about climate change translating science to policy. We understand Maxwell is a, a policy school. So I will talk more about uh, the international negotiation, the climate debate, and the policy. But uh, I understand that probably we need to talk a little bit about the climate change itself, because this is a scientific issue. Maybe some of you already know about this issue, especially those who come from ESF. I can see some faces. Uh, maybe uh, this is very familiar with you. And please bear with me, bear with us. I will explain a little bit about the climate change itself. And one more disclaimer that I'm not a climate technical expert. So uh, if you have more technical questions, uh, I hope we can have more discussion and maybe some students from ESF can help to answer some technical questions. OK, this is my outline. Uh, I will talk about the current challenges uh, in climate uh, international negotiation, and then also what's the solution offered, and then what's the progress uh, in the international uh, policy discussion, and also a little bit about um, the condition in my country. As we know that everybody talk about climate change. This is like a bus. This relates with almost all dimensions of human life, mm -hmm. food security, health, and economics, politics, everything. Even sometimes we blame uh, small things to climate change. Oh, this is because of climate change or global warming. And um, in international, national, and local, everybody talk about this issue. So I think it's very relevant for us uh, to also update ourselves about uh, climate change. And even in SDG, this is one of the target, number 13, about climate change. Uh, but the, the word itself sometimes is very scary and very formal, very serious, that people think that it's very complicated. But once we learn more, uh, this really relates with our daily life. Some people think this is hoax. This is, um, this is just an issue raised by some policymakers or scientists. And recently, the President of the United States said that this is a, ho a hoax in his Twitter. He said the concept of global warming was created by and for the Chinese in order to make US manufacturing non-competitive. Um, it's up to you, do you believe this or not? And, but another president said that no challenge poses a greater threat to future generations than climate change by Barack Obama. And I'm sure you know this face, Leonardo DiCaprio. He said he's one of the most active person now in the world uh, to support the action against climate change. He said, scientist, scientific consensus is in and the argument is now over. If you do not believe in climate change, you do not believe in facts or in science or empirical truth. And therefore, in my humble opinion, should not be allowed to hold a public of office. And Stephen Colbert, maybe you know him. He said, global warming isn't real because I was cold today. And Syracuse is cold, so it's not global warming. And also, great news, world hunger is over because I just ate. Some people, some people also have this kind of argument. I feel cold, and nothing happened. So global warming is not real. Actually, global warming is not only locally. Uh, it's not a local condition. It's a global condition. So we may not feel it in our village or city, but in, the, in terms of the pattern, the climate pattern in the world, it really happened. And I will, yeah, this is one of the evidence that global warming is real. From 1720 to 2006, so people feel more warmer and warmer. And this is one of a very important indicator that scientists try to measure year by year every September or at the end of summer, that they try to see the thickness and the coverage of sea ice in the Arctic. 
It has been dropped by 40% since 1979. And uh, it is predicted, uh, a recent study by IUCN and the Nature Climate Change says that in 2050, uh, the Arctic will experience ice-free summer. So it means every summer it will be no ice uh, for three months. And then in 2100, there will be five months without ice every summer. So this is a very strong indication that we, we've never seen in human history. So why is this really important? This, this area is not only important for the animal, of course, uh, even though the population reduced uh, more than 30% in the last three generations. But uh, Arctic sea ice really helped to regulate the planet's temperature. Because one, it is shrinking down it can confuse or distract the climate pattern even as far as the US, as far as Africa, as far as Asia. So this is really important to conserve or to protect this sea ice. What exactly is climate change? I'm sure you all know. Can anybody help me to explain what climate change is? Voluntary? Or no one knows? OK, Will. The changing of the average weather over time. Uh, the climate is the average weather over 30 year period. So over time, we're seeing warming or changes in that climate from uh, place to place. Yeah, yeah. Climate is more um, longer and cover huge area. It's different with weather. Weather is very like a short term and cover small area. And climate change is a change in global or regional climate pattern in particular a change apparent from the mid to late 20th century onwards and attributed largely to the increase of the earth temperature. So climate change happened when the earth temperature increased drastically, very extreme and very fast. And this, this, this makes the climate pattern become unpredicted or anomaly. We cannot say that, oh, it's getting hotter or colder. But sometimes it's cold, sometimes it's cold, and we cannot really predict that. What about global warming? Can someone help me? Kim? Yeah, this, just that <clears throat> because of the climate change or maybe other issues, the temperature of the globe is uh, increasing. So that is what that. Yeah, it's a increase, the increase of global temperature in the entire world. Yeah. So it's upward temperature trend. There is a trend uh, of the increased temperature across the entire Earth since the Industrial Revolution due to the increased levels of atmospheric carbon dioxide produced by the use of fossil fuel. Why is from Industrial Revolution? We will discuss about it later in the next slide. So since 1880, the average surface temperature has gone up by about 0.8 degrees Celsius or 1.4 degrees Fahrenheit. This is a global not just local. And even increase 1.1 is very uh, uh, important, and that's really affect the climate, relatively to the mid 20th century baseline. So this is the figure of the increased temperature from 1880 to uh, predicted in 2020, it will be higher than one degree Celsius. So before revolution, this is below zero. And now it's one degree. And what makes the global temperature increase rapidly? We may, I mentioned about revolution industry. So there is a massive production and consumption of natural resources and mostly produced by fossil fuel like oil, coal. And this um, uh, fossil fuel, the burning of this fossil fuel, um, they are trapped in the atmosphere and this trap the heat from the sun this make the earth become warmer and warmer. I'm sure you maybe know about this greenhouse gas, uh, greenhouse effect caused by greenhouse gases that trap in the atmosphere. So this is the emission, greenhouse gas emission, uh, contained of mostly carbon dioxide, 82%, and 9% methane, nitrous oxide, and uh, fluorinated gases. So carbon dioxide, the so carbon, um, there are carbon in almost all um, plants. So when we open the, when we converse, 
when we convert the, the land, become a building, so we release the carbon dioxide to the earth. Everything in this earth actually contain carbon. And methane, this is uh, uh, um, mammals usually, uh, like uh, the mammals, sorry, the dirt, usually contain uh, methane. So in huge cattle farm, when they have a large amount of cow, dirt, actually this release a lot of methane. And nitro uh, oxide, uh, this is from uh, fertilizers, pesticide in agriculture, in, in industrial agriculture. And fluorinated gases, this is from uh, air conditioners, refrigerators. And this is all the human activities that cause all this carbon that release to the atmosphere. And this is the global carbon emission from fossil fuel. Uh, this is in million metric tons of carbon uh, during uh, revolution industry. This is less than 1,000, but in 2013, it is 10,000 uh, metric ton of carbon. This is two data from different departments uh, in the US. This is US Department of Energy. This is United States Environment Protection Agency. And they have uh, slightly different, but show the same trend. And this is per capita, the consumption of per capita. This is two different sources. This is from uh, a scientist associated with the UN. And this is from World Bank. They have different figures. If you see, this is 1.3, this is 5. But both shows the same trend. So I understand that each scientist, they have different methods, different figures, different results. But we can see all the results shows the same pattern. So isn't it climate always changing? This question always come. People always say that climate always changing from uh, prehistoric era until now, of course, it's getting warmer. So what do you think? It is true that there is a natural change of climate change. Every 100 years, uh, there is a change in, in the orbit of the Earth, uh, become eclipse, and sometimes become cycle. So this brings different level of exposure from the sun to the Earth. So this makes the earth sometimes warm, sometimes cold, but this happened every 100 years. This is natural. But what happened now, 90% of scientists agree that this change is not caused by a variation of the orbit, but rather likely caused by the human activities, as I mentioned before. So climate change, this is the change of pattern caused by the earth temperature, caused by greenhouse effect, greenhouse effect caused by a lot of Greenhouse gases trapped in the atmosphere, and greenhouse gases produced by human activities. This is some of the largest greenhouse gas producers. Um, this is the some uh, examples, like industrial agriculture. I mentioned about the use of fertilizer, pesticides, and also in cattle uh, that produce methane. Forest burning that release a lot of carbon dioxide. And industrial process, they use uh, coal and oil as their energy. And power plant, the majority of power plant for electricity in the world cause coal and air transport from the burning of the, what the name, aerosol? The name of the uh, gas. And coal mining as well, the burning of the coal mining and the extraction. And thawing permafrost. Do you know thawing? Permafrost, yeah. Permafrost is a frozen soil that is located in, I think, in Arctic, and this store a lot of dangerous gases like mercury and a lot of microbes. And if this is melted, this will release all these dangerous uh, gases to the earth. And now it's getting warmer the condition, and if this release, so it will bring a lot of disaster to human being. So what should we care of? I will just make it fast. This is what happens, no ice melted, and then sea level uh, increase, and this become warmer because of the uh, greenhouse effect, and then damage the coral reef, and some spe uh, species that rely their life on coral also die, and then 
a lot of evaporation and then a lot of precipitation and then uh, makes the uh, rainfall become more intense but in short term. So it creates flood and also more dry drought and increase the potential for forest fire. And mostly the heat absorbed by the sea. You can see the red color, this is the the five degrees Celsius temperature in the sea. Yeah, 93% of the heat absorbed by the sea and increase sea surface temperature and increase the evaporation and this increase the uh, incidence of storm hurricanes. This is some of the disaster caused by uh, climate anomaly. And increased trend of disaster. You can see the color. This is a disaster caused by climatological events. This is hydrological events, meteorological events, and this is not related with climate. This is more ge geographical, like eruption. So more disasters are related with climate or hydrology or meteorology. And this also brings risk to socioeconomic life, of course, decrease the water supply, damage infrastructure, and also disrupted food productivity, and also increase the um, potential of malaria because malaria is the cause by mosquito that can only live in tropical area. And this is the current distribution, the yellow color, and the red color is the possible expansion of malaria by 2050 because the weather is getting warmer. So what is the solution? Seems so scary. So what's the solution? There are two options offered. Um, first is mitigation and second is adaptation. Mitigation is global responsibility. So all countries in the world uh, need to mitigate or reduce the emission. So mitigation is the action to reduce the emission that contribute to climate change to mitigate the risk, and adaptation is the, the way to adapt with the impact of climate change. So this is more local responsible, responsibility, because each country, even each village, even here in Syracuse and in Rochester, they have different, um, different vulnerability to climate change. This is some of the options, like mitigation, sustainable transportation, renewable energy, industrial process improvement, Adaptation is resilience housing that more resistant to drought, uh, no, sorry, to, uh, to flood or early warning system to disaster, relocated shelter during disaster, embankment, so to reduce the abrasion, drought resistant plant, like in agriculture, to have more drought resistant seed and underground power line. So when there is flood, when there is disaster, they still have power. And this is the combination, some activities that can contribute to mitigation and contribute to adaptation. Okay, I want to show you a little bit about this a video. What happened? Oh, really? This is not my computer, so I don't know. He cut the world's yearly carbon emissions by a third. Already, Germany generates 27% of its electricity from renewables, with a goal of 80% by 2050. Climate change, it's real, it's serious, and it's up to us to solve it. In the last two decades, we've experienced 14 of the hottest 15 years on record. By 2050, drought and chronic water shortages could impact a billion people, while millions more will be at risk from coastal flooding. It can seem overwhelming, but there's reason for hope. 
If we embrace solar and wind power to their full potential, we can cut the world's yearly carbon emissions by a third. Already, Germany generates 27% of its electricity from renewables, with a goal of 80% by 2050. Denmark has shown it can produce more wind energy than it can use, and England is building the world's biggest offshore wind farm. Communities large and small are taking steps. A new public building in Mexico City has an exterior that breaks down air pollutants, erasing the effects of 1,000 cars each day. Paris installed street tiles that harvest energy from foot traffic. Other cities are paving streets with smoggy concrete and sidewalks with recycled materials. Individuals can make a difference too through the choices we make every day. If every American driver drove 10 miles less each week, it could eliminate more than 100 billion pounds of carbon from the air each year. New innovations are making important strides possible, and more are on the way, but we can't wait. Reimagining our world's energy future will take a shared sense of urgency from countries, companies, cities, and all of us. Working together, real change is possible. Learn more at napgeo.com slash climate. I hope you enjoy the video. Let me continue. Okay, and now I'm going to talk more about the policy discussion. So environment, uh, climate change is not just an uh, environmental issue. This relates with social, economics, health, and all these things needs policy to regulate um, how to mitigate and adapt to climate change. But policy making is not as easy as that. Policy making is not a linear process. It's not just a rational decision making that we rely on the policymakers to understand the problems and analyze and make decision and implement and then evaluate them. But when the problem happened, we often blame on the implementation. But we forgot that the, the process, it doesn't only involve the fact or evidence or rational thinking, but this involves the values, perspective of, of or interests of the policymakers itself and all the power behind it. So there are so many competing agendas. And also in climate change, there are so many competing agendas between the countries who produce more emission and countries who are more vulnerable to climate change and they are competing what, what is the priority, what is the most important agenda. And even there is a disagreement about the problem itself. Even some countries say that this is, this is hoax and we don't want to contribute and some countries think this is very important so even to see the problem is very different and there is a discretion and negotiation between all these parties and this is this is what I learned before about policy making that this involves the discourses or the narrative how we build the narrative how uh, we tell the story about and how we think which one is more important and how we use research technical information knowledge to build the narrative and also involve a lot of actors, alliance, international organization, NGO, government, and what's the power underlying between these actors? What the powers that enable or uh, block the process? And even scientists, it's very difficult for them to convince the policymakers when they say threaten our existence, everybody's sleeping. But then once they say the streets and our economics and they're awake and it shows that the, the, the interests of scientists and interests of policymakers are, can be very totally different. And in international level, the UN facilitate uh, discussion, uh, international climate policy negotiation. And this happens every year at the end of the year, every November or December in different countries. Uh, we call it the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change. This is the, the one of the most important events uh, that policymakers wait and they want to come to negotiate. UNFCCC, this is adopted in 1992 in Rio de Janeiro uh, during Earth Summit. There were three important conventions agreed, uh, adopted uh, in this summit. First is UNFCCC and UNCDB, Convention on Biodiversity, and UNCCD, Combat uh, 
the desertification. And UNFCCC come into force in 1994 when more countries sign and agree with this and start to have their meetings in 1995. And now it has 197 parties, so almost all countries in the world become the parties and they organize conference of parties or COP every year. And the aim is to uh, assess the progress in dealing with climate change and to stabilize the greenhouse gas at the level that would prevent dangerous effect. And they produce protocols or agreement every year. Not all protocols and agreement are influential. Some protocols or agreement just become a document, but some protocols become very uh, influential and demand the commitment of countries. And the stakeholders in COP, they divide it into three plus observer. Annex one is the developed countries, industrial, uh, uh, industrial country that are member of OECD. So these countries are the one who uh, have more economic growth and use fossil fuel in their industry. So they produce more greenhouse gases. And EIT, this is economics in transition, like Russia, Baltic, and several Central and Eastern Europe. So they have obligation, they are obliged to reduce emission. And next two is OECD, but not EIT parties, and they are obliged to provide financial assistance to developing countries. Non-annex is the developing countries. This is the one who are more vulnerable to climate change or rely their economic mostly on the production of fossil fuel. Observer are UN system NGO and NGO. And this is based on regions. This is just for administrative purpose. And this is based on interest. As I mentioned, that policy involves a lot of actors based on the interest. This is the interest group. Like group of 77, this is developing countries plus China. Alliance of small islands, mostly they're very vulnerable, like very, very small, like Tuvalu, Fiji, Solomon. They're very small island and very vulnerable. And least developed country, this is mostly from Africa. And European Union umbrella group is uh, non-EU developed countries like the US, Canada, and environmental integrity group and other groups. And these groups, they are fighting every year in UNFCCC. That makes the process become so difficult. And this is the global inequity of the responsibility of climate change. The red color, this one, this is the one who produce more fossil fuel and benefit from the economic growth. Uh, but they are less least vulnerable to climate change. And the green, the dark green, the dark green are the ones who are most vulnerable, but they produce least uh, greenhouse gases. Oh yeah, this is the uh, condition in 2050. This is the prediction. And this is the progress after 20 years of organizing conference. Uh, as I mentioned, there are some protocols that are important, but some others are not really influential. One of them is Kyoto Protocol. This is in Japan in 1997. This is uh, the first... Uh, um, the first decision that very, very important and that most countries agree to reduce greenhouse gas emission, uh, mostly for Annex 1. So they agree about the, the, the division of this country, Annex 1, Annex 1, Annex 3, and Annex 1 agree to reduce greenhouse gas emission. And this protocol enters into force in 2005. All the countries... Uh, in Annex 1, sign these protocols, except the United States. Uh, this is divided by two rounds. The first round is until 2012, and the second round, 2013 to 2015. But in the second round, more countries withdraw. More countries decided not to continue, because they see the US also doesn't uh, sign or, or, or ratify. And why should I ratify? Why should I? Uh, have obligation. So this is failed in 2015. And Bali Roadmap, this is um, the turning point for countries to have cooperation. So 
let's say Norway can reduce their emission by providing money to Indonesia, and Indonesia is the one who reduces the emission. So they can get the incentive, they can claim the credit. So this is the decision in 2007 that they can cooperate like that. 2009, this is the moment that uh, the world agreed to limit the temperature or temperature up to uh, uh, maximum two degrees Celsius. This is also a milestone. And the most recent is Paris Agreement. This is the most recent and very, very good turning point. And almost all countries in the world ratify and agree that they need to reduce greenhouse gases. And based on the lesson learned from Kyoto Protocol, now they do not divide countries based on annex. All people are obliged to reduce greenhouse gas emission, but with different responsibilities. So they call it common but differentiated. All people are obliged, but with different level. Even US, China, India, and Brazil signed Paris Agreement. This is before President Trump was elected. Um, they, con they decided to continue maintain the uh, two degrees Celsius, if, if possible, 1.5. And this is also a very important milestone, nationally determined contribution. And this, this is the contribution for each country. Each country needs to submit their target by 2020. Let's say Indonesia, we want to decrease 29% of our greenhouse emission. And it is written and, uh, with full strategy. And 169 countries have submitted their first NDC. So this is a huge uh, progress. And also one of Important point is uh, rich countries, developed countries agree to provide 100 billion US dollar per year. This is minimum. I don't know how and from which country, but this is a good news. This is the, the top largest countries who produce emission. Number one, China, United States, EU, 28 countries, India, Russia, Japan, Brazil, Indonesia also there, Mexico, and Iran. If this country reduce their emission, this will leave nothing, almost nothing to the rest of the countries because they account almost three quarters of the greenhouse gases. This is per capita. I will make it fast. And this is the performance so far. Uh, no one is in the very good category. But in good category is Sweden, Lithuania, Morocco, and, uh, and very low is, I think Indonesia is also part of very low, and the US. This is in terms of climate policy. Um, those countries who have developed a certain, uh, like a set of policy. And this is the climate finance flow. The, the countries who contribute to climate finance are Australia, Canada, EU, France, Germany, Japan, Norway, UK, and US. And in 2017, almost 2 billion US dollar. This is still very far from 100 billion US dollar. There are 152 projects in 70 countries. And mostly goes to Southeast Asia and Pacific, Sub-Saharan -Sub Africa, and Latin America and Caribbean. But mostly uh, in loans, not grants, in terms of loans. So what makes it so difficult, even though we have Paris Agreement, but we don't know the result, this is still progress. Because each country has different level of capacity, um, uh, different level of vulnerability and capacity to climate change. And also they play negotiation games, they are waiting like US waiting for China, China waiting for US. So they think this, not, this is not my responsibility. So why should I go first? I will wait for other people and I will benefit the, the pledge uh, done by other countries and I become the free riders. This mostly happened in climate negotiation. I joined the Copenhagen UNFCCC and I noticed this, that they are really buying time. And lack of scientific insight before and also, this also affects to the economic of the country, of course, and they calculate about the benefit and the cost that they will get. And also, mitigation really dominates the discussion. Yeah, this is just some intermezzo. So they are just talking and talking and talking, and then while the world is getting uh, worse, the climate is getting worse. 
and this also from Bali. I also joined the conference in Bali. I think I will skip this. In Indonesia, this is just two more slides. In Indonesia, we committed to reduce 26% through business as usual and 41% with international finance or international aid. Uh, we committed this in Bali uh, conference in 2007. And then we all already submitted our NDC. This is our NDC. And we revised the target, uh, increasing 26 to 29%. Uh, from energy industry and mostly from deforestation and pitland destruction because this is our um, This is the sector that contribute most to greenhouse gases and we have pitland and restoration agency uh, This is just recently established by government with the target to, to Restore 2 million hectare pitland in five years and we have Indonesian climate change trust fund to fundraise uh, the money and the government also allocate 15.9 trillion US dollar for greenhouse gas emission reduction per year. And this is some tools that we already developed to monitor the progress. And this is all the regulation that we have from national to presidential regulation, ministerial regulation, and the documents, national action plan for greenhouse gas emission reduction, national action plan for adaptation. And also even in province, each province has regional development plan from, for the greenhouse gas emission. Okay, so that's my presentation. Thank you very much for your attention and for your time. <laughs> Any questions? Okay. Jane. Jane. Yeah. So, the Paris Agreement? Correct me if I'm wrong, but as far as I know, that if the majority of countries signs it, still it's not. Yeah. So how long, how do you see that this is like a big turning point and how is it going to be the problem? How does that continue? Yeah. I just want to show you the um, tracker. This is the recent, this is the update. Every second, World Resource Institute has this tracker. This is very interesting. This is about Paris Agreement. So you can check this by yourself. 75. One, sorry, 175 parties join. So these protocols, Paris Agreement, will come into force or legally binding once there are 55 countries signed. But now, this exceeds this number. At or minimum 55% greenhouse gases um, like a, committed from countries. And this also exceeds the, the number. So it means this has come into force. This is legally binding. And you can see the color. This is join the agreement. This is sign. Sign means they just, OK, they agree. When they attend the conference, and they discuss, and they agree, OK, they adopt, and they sign. But each country need to go back to their country, talk with the parliament, talk with the legislative, and set up the national policy, and then get ready with this. And then once they are ready, they, will, they have to release a regulation that they ratify this protocols. It means they join the agreement. And you can see a lot of countries already joined, and this sign only that, and intend to withdraw the US. And the effect of the, the, the intention of the US to withdraw, actually this can affect other countries to also withdraw. And this will s slow down the progress again. Actually, this is very fast progress. And it was targeted that this protocol will come into force by 2020. But only in four months. It was adopted in December 2015. And by April 2016, already reached this target. So it means there is a huge commitment from a lot of countries to this agreement. Yeah. And then now the homework is. For all these countries, they need to develop NDC, the National Determined Contribution for each country, and they submit it to UNFCCC by 2020. And UNFCCC will 
evaluate or measure the progress in, in every five years. And I think the US committed to reduce the carbon um, by 26% to 28%, but refused to reduce it by 80%. Actually, they have to reduce, US has to reduce up to 80%, but um, they just uh, committed to reduce up to 28%. And there is a research recently that actually it only takes 1% from GDP, from US GDP, to reduce the greenhouse gases of 80% by 2050. But I don't know what makes it difficult to make the decision. I hope that answers your question. Any other comment, reflection, or? Megan. Yeah, I have a question. So obviously, we're all pretty aware of how politicized this issue is start of your presentation, and I just want to hear more about how you would use, what strategies you would use to kind of reach across the aisle to try to talk to people who might believe that this is a hoax and reframe it as less of an issue of climate change, like we need to do something now or our lives depend on it, because that's not necessarily the case, depending on what models you look at, and also how, how would you talk about this in terms of a site-specific issue. So if you're talking to people throughout New England, New York about climate change, who might not have as much of an understanding of the issue as we do, how do you strategize how you're talking about this from a policy standpoint to, to craft an effective policy? Because we can sit here and talk about you know, all these issues all day in our own bubble here, but yeah. how, do we, how do we make that into an actual reality? Yeah. Actually, if we have more time, I would like to share about one of my experiences in uh, promoting climate change policy in one district in Indonesia. And it was successful that the district had committed to integrate climate change mitigation and adaptation strategy into their midterm regional development plan from 2017 to 2022. And in the beginning, it was difficult because when I came to that district, this is, I just give you um, a story that maybe you can uh, extract some lesson learned from that. So when I came to the district, um, they didn't deny climate change. They just didn't know at all about this. And it's so hard and it's so difficult for us to talk to the government officers in this district. And this district is like, um, Gorontalo is quite far from Jakarta. And, with not really high access to uh, information. And then we try to analyze the stakeholders. We try to analyze the, the power. So we try to see which one, who, who has the more uh, role to make decision. Of course, the district head. And fortunately, the district head has background in, in environment. So we try to talk to him, even though I, I can sense that after talking for one hour, he didn't really get the point. But and then instead of talking about the scientific information, we talk more about his, the way he talked. We talk to him using policy language, using his <coughs> language. So we try to analyze about his political platform, what his interests. So when he did the campaign to run for uh, district head, we read all the, all the political uh, platform and we try to talk with him using this language. Let's say he said that, oh, I want to, uh, ensure that there is no poverty and the food production increase. So we use that language to say that if you don't do this, so the food production will be difficult. So we never, we don't really use all this scientific information because that's our language. So when we talk with them, we try to translate it to their language. And, and then once he said, okay, I really like this. So once we get the interest from him and then we say, okay, and then we work with all the technical people, these technical people follow what the district had said. Once the district had said that, okay, I want to continue this. And we lock this by having an agreement, guidance, something. And then this become obligation for all the department in that district to, to, to work with us together. And then we organize regular meeting with the district head attended by all the government officers, like the uh, head of departments. And the district head talk about all his interest and commitment related with our program. So this makes all 
district had realized, uh, sorry, the head of the department realized that how important this is for the, for the district head. So we try to fulfill and we try to meet his need. And we bring journalists, we bring media, and increase his name as a champion. And now, and he talked in UNFCCC in Marrakesh in, in 2017. Our project was in 2016, and we said that we can promote you to speak in this international conference, and you can share about your success stories from your district. And he was so excited. And he talked in a lot of uh, forums in, at the national level. So I mean, um, I think it's really difficult to just explain about what it is. Sometimes we need to understand the interests of that policymakers. That's my lesson learned. I hope this yeah. explains. Yeah. 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 Like that, the picture about the scientists. They said climate change threatened the, our existence, and this doesn't work. And then he changed the language, and that can attract more attention. Zach. Thanks. Um, I just want to say really quick, like climate denialism in the U.S. It really relies on strengthening the narrative that there's no consensus in the scientific community. So, if, if you are interested in kind of looking across the aisle here in the U.S., that's that's one thing to, to really look at. Narratives. I, I was really curious for you. This might be too soon, but the oil spill in Indonesia right now. How do you think that will affect? Yeah. No, actually, you are right. That it's not only about oil spill, but a lot of other cases that actually doesn't correlate with the commitment or the policy. This is the commitment in the national level, but in the implementation, it's always difficult. And um, also, this relates a lot of actors like private sectors who have that business. And this commitment, as I mentioned about all the law, commitment from the President and commitment from some ministers, even other ministers, they don't think this is a serious things. And um, all the regulation, as I enlist before, this is still a document. And at the provincial level also, it is still a document. But the implementation is still struggling. They just put it and they put their budget, like Gorontalo District, as I mentioned, they put this in the regional development plan and they and they allocate budget 50 billion US dollar every year for climate change, but the implementation still, the, the policy implementer, sometimes they don't really uh, get the sense about what their uh, head uh, intend to. And for the oil, oil spill, it does, and it happened not only once, it happened again and again. And the land conversion still happen in Indonesia, forest fire still happen, everything still happen. I'm not saying that my country is really good in terms of climate change um, policy, because as I also show, uh, showed you the list of the climate policy um, progress, performance, Indonesia is still in the bottom groups. Mire. Thank you for your interesting presentation. Thank you. Uh, Thank you, you show a, a map of a country I did was concerning uh, pollution. I'm curious to know the meaning of yellow color because my country was totally yellow. Which one? Uh, yes, yes, this one. This yellow? Yeah. This is Cameroon? No, of course. Uh, yes. Here, right? No, yellow, yellow. Yeah. Yes. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So if you see this information, this is uh, emission level. This y axis is emission level, and x axis is climate change vulnerability. It means the yellow is in between. So you produce emission, but not that uh, as much as countries in this area. And also, you are vulnerable to climate change, but not as vulnerable as this country. So this is in between. Any other questions, comment, reflection? Irma? Um, I wonder if there is any discussion of uh, our movement about how to help transnational cooperation 
to be held accountable because as you know, in Indonesia there are a lot of uh, oil companies and land companies that is not Indonesian standards. They are actually like foreigners company. So is there any decision you have to take? Yeah. Have you ever heard RSPO? No. Roundtable uh, sustainable on palm oil. A roundtable discussion on sustainable of palm oil. So this is a forum, but not as high as UNFCCC. This is the forum that um, try to uh, encourage or to promote sustainable palm oil and involve private sector at oil and gas company to be part of these members. And they are part of these members, like big multinational companies and national companies. And as I mentioned that the, the negotiation, the agreement, it's not as easy as that, even though they are the member, they attend every meeting, and they, are, and they need to commit to, to, to run their business in a sustainable way and not to burn the forest when they open the plantation. But still, um, the pledge, like, it's very difficult to get their commitment and pledge for them. The forums are there, like UNFCCC uh, provide this platform, provide this forum, and facilitate the meeting every year and invite all this. But still, the progress sometimes is difficult. Yeah. And in Indonesia, there is a RSPO and an Indonesian Palm Oil Association. They make ISPO. There are some standards to be sustainable. But still, this is just documents and idle things. But no one wants to pledge. No one wants to commit. That's really difficult. I appreciate your presentation. Yes. And also, I like the way in Indonesia, when you change the language and approaching that official, there is been marketing or they say, give the message you want and the package they want. Yeah. So we do it that way. Uh, there's hopefully at least a discussion. In fact, the another thought I thought I'd like to stop this uh, greenhouse emission gases and things like that. Major cities, if they do in some of the countries, like provide free transportation, will that reduce people coming in, pollution and things like that. Yeah, yeah. Just a thought. Yeah, thank you for the, for the reflection. Yeah, I mean, this is also a reflection that I think um, we cannot talk with the same language with all people or all countries or all network or alliance, like in the climate negotiation. When we talk with the, let's say, developed countries or industrial country, we can talk from economic perspective. Let's say by changing your energy to renewable or having a more renewable technology, you will benefit this in the future because all people in the future will buy this kind of device, uh, devices rather than the, the, the products flow from unrenewable energy. So something like to provide the calculation cost and benefit. I don't really see this. I don't really see this in climate negotiation process about the projection about the benefit, economic benefit in the future, because the projection mostly about the, the, the destruction that will happen by 2050, 20, and then the eco, like a business people will think that, I don't care as long as I, have, uh, I can make money in the next 10 years, 20 years after that, I, I will not witness what happened in 50 years, but if there is a, like a benefit analysis about what will happen in 2050 or 2100 about the about the consum uh, consumption of renewable energy consumption of like a transportation that use more sustainable energy, I've I've never seen this. So there is no like a prediction about the economic benefit by investing in climate change. I don't really see that. Amit and Yaya. Okay, yeah, you. so Amit and then Yaya. Yeah, yeah okay. and then we'll take those two questions and then we'll okay. uh, okay. okay. Actually, by going to this map, I was wondering that those countries, big countries which are producing more greenhouse gases are less vulnerable compared to others. Yeah. Do you find any reason for that in your research? Uh, from what I read, this is a general um, information or general knowledge that I read that they produce more greenhouse gases, of course, because they are industrialized country. They are growing. They are using fossil fuel. But they are less vulnerable because they are huge, mostly. 
and they have more cap capacity means when we analyze the capacity of a country, this relates with the exposure to disaster. This relates with their economic capacity to recover quickly from the disasters. And this relates with the social also uh, uh, capacity. So there are, I think, some indicators to measure the capacity or the vulnerability level of a country. And countries in the southern part have less capacity to cope or to recover quickly and more exposed, especially those who live in small islands like this, more, more exposed. So it's not only about physical vulnerability, but also socio and economic vulnerability. Uh, I want to comment about uh, what you're saying about the palm oil. So recently, uh, Europe, Europe nation, uh, they just banned the products of uh, palm oil. And the reason is just because of uh, our palm oil produce because of uh, deforestation. Yeah. And then the reason of the climate change. And uh, I noticed that you said before in, the, in your presentation that uh, most of the Europe countries or the developed countries, uh, they just didn't sign or almost re uh, redraw about uh, their intention into the uh, Paris Agreement. So how can you say that uh, they say that our product will uh, consume on the global warming or climate change? Uh, in the in the other case, uh, they just uh, they just they just do not uh, accept the Paris Agreement. Yeah, actually, like you know, uh, if we see the map again, once again, actually, AU they sign and they ratify Paris Agreement and they committed uh, to reduce the. Can I maybe open it again and we check together? I think they sign and they ratify. Yeah, this. This area, right? Yeah, I think mostly they joined the agreement. The purple color? No, this, the green. Oh, the green. The green. Mostly they joined the agreement. No. Yeah. And about the standard for palm oil, yes, it is true that they reject not only palm oil, but also fisheries product, like all, all products that produce un, uh, in an in unsustainable way. They have very high standard. For them. All right, we're gonna have to leave it there. Thank you very much. Thank you, Nasla. Thank you very much.